Dave Palumbo here, and we're back with another exciting installment of the history of bodybuilding. Joining us today, he came highly regarded by our good friend Ed Connors. He says he's got some great stories about the old days in Venice Golds. So I had to have him here for this show. The man I'm talking about is Rick Newcomb. Welcome to the show. Um, well, thank you very much, Dave. You're the owner of Creators Publishing. I know you're a publisher published many, many books over the years by some you know, bodybuilders that we might know, and we're gonna talk about it a little bit, but you also have had in-gym experience, and that's invaluable. You said you were, appeared in uh, the 1964 Muscular Development Magazine, and at 71 years old, you're still working out five, six days a week. That's amazing. That's right, that's right. Um, I really appreciate being here, and I wanna tell the story about the book I've written called The Magic of Lifting Weights, Okay. What happened was uh, I had been I, I am a very successful entrepreneur in the publishing and newspaper syndication business and now digital syndication mm -hmm. and um, with global influence. I mean, syndicating people like uh, Tucker Carlson or Hillary Clinton or Ben Shapiro Amazing. Uh, or Wizard of Vid cartoons. And uh, but at the same time, it, it I. When I was home during the lockdown, I thought about my bodybuilding and how lifting weights had really shaped my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, going back to when I was 12 years old and I saw a strength and health magazine and on the cover was a Frenchman named Guy Mirzuk, <laughs> who was Mr. France and he competed in, in the universe. Uh, and this was when I was 12 years old. So it was, it was in March, 1963. Wow. Okay. And I bought that magazine and I just fell in love with bodybuilding. And right. then I discovered uh, a Mr. America contender in downtown Chicago. I had grown up in Chicago in the suburbs of Chicago mm -hmm. named Rock Stonewall. And I got to know Rock and he was uh, uh, just so kind and so knowledgeable about uh -huh. uh, lifting. And so I tell the story in the, in the book about how I got started. But as I look back now, being in my 70s, I realized that I learned something that your audience uh, knows but is not aware of, and that is how to train, how to eat properly, eat healthily, how to um, the proper nutrition, proper rest, all of those things that we learn in bodybuilding right. help us when we're in our 60s and 70s if we pivot a little bit, if, if you try to just, you know, keep building big muscles uh, in your 70s. And there are some people I know who do that. Yeah, um, I don't think that's particularly healthy. I think what what we need to do is figure out or what I try to do for myself. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like to tell other people what they need to do <laughs> just for myself. Yeah, that use it by shifting from to lighter weights and good form right. and little to no rest between sets. I find that in my 70s, I still have a real bounce in my step. I feel very youthful. So I thought, you know, this is really, it's almost like a, it's a foundation for energy for mm -hmm. our golden years. And I thought I should write and just tell my story about how all of this has evolved. And then, it, you know, in, in terms of building creators syndicate and creators publishing and working with my son, who's running it now. Oh, that's cool. Um, this this was it, I used the principles of bodybuilding to build a business. Mm. And so often it's one of the reasons that I really was attracted to Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, going back. We, we met when he was 30. I was 27. And uh, when we first met and Arnold was one of the few people who um, figured out how to make a lot of money, you know, how to how to be a good businessman. Sure. And um, and be a bodybuilder, be a champion bodybuilder. What do you think is the secret to, to, to earning a living in this sport? I mean, I, I always approach bodybuilding and the business of bodybuilding from the same perspective. So I, I put the work ethic I put into going to the gym, I put into you know running RX Muscle or my species nutrition business or whatever else I happen to be doing. And I find that if I put the work in and, and I immerse myself in what I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm successful. Um, a lot of other people find it, it's a little harder to to find a niche for themselves where they could actually make a living from the sport that they actually love to do. Because let's face it, there's only a limited lifespan on how long you can compete. And most people who compete don't make any money anyway. So 
What do you? What would be your best, you know, business advice you can give to people? I, I follow your example. What you're doing is exactly right. I mean, and those principles. I mean, in the book, I concluded. I I did. I entered one contest uh, and came in third place in Mr. Los Angeles. Uh, you know, 35, 40 years ago. And um, I made a list of eight steps that I went through uh, to get there. And if you use those same principles right. in, in building a business or out, mapping out your career, um, they work. Right. What's they the work. most important principle, would you say? I would say the most important is to have an un shakable belief that you will reach your goals no matter what so that no matter what obstacles or what setbacks you encounter right. um that's just nothing more than an obstacle or a setback it's mm -hmm. not a defeat yeah. so no matter what um you will reach your goal i you know it's funny because i i give people advice it it pretty much is the same thing as you're saying except i just tell people if you don't quit you won't fail you that's can't right. fail that's I right. think too many we people miss, just quit right before they're about to succeed, you know. That's right. That great one-liner, we miss 100% of the shots we don't take. That's right. There you go. And in, in the book, which can I hold it up? Yeah, All absolutely. Right. Show us. We All want right. to. Good. It's called The Magic of Lifting Weights. And I tell how it's Is it's that you now? Is that picture you now or was that? Yeah, that's, this was me. Yeah. What year was that taken? That was a couple of years ago. You got was, some good arms on you. Look at those arms at 70 years yeah. old. Holy mackerel. Well, I was 68. That's still pretty impressive. <laughs> but, but I tell the story that this was not a professional photographer. This was not anything staged. I was yeah. working out. It was my 68th birthday. Uh -huh. And we have an office gym. We're in Hermosa Beach, California. Beautiful. And, uh, you know, I was just doing my morning workout. And, um, and a, a fellow employee named Sheila... Uh, was walking by and Sheila and I both shared August 8 as our birthdays and mm -hmm. she opened the, the door to the gym and because it's got glass uh, windows so she could see me and she said happy birthday Rick and I said happy <laughs> birthday Sheila and I said hey Sheila can you do me a favor I got this new iPhone and it's supposed to have a really good camera can you just take my picture I'll flex my muscles so she did and um, the the whole point there is it, it wasn't staged it wasn't right. I didn't train for it or anything. That's you didn't just the filter that... the pictures either, right? What's that? <laughs> you know how everyone filters their pictures now on Instagram, right? Right, right. No, no. Filter. Not this filters. Is... Right. So, um, yeah. So that, that's that's why I, I, I think your audience doesn't realize how much, uh, how much farther ahead they are from the general populace mm -hmm. because they know how to do exercises. They know how to train that is just invaluable. Um, you know, since publishing the book, I've gotten the most common question has been, where do I find a good personal trainer? <laughs> because my advice, I say the most important investment, if you haven't lifted weights, absolutely. If, if you're just starting is to find a good personal trainer. Who Don't, trained you? Well, it was initially Rock Stonewall and then Franco Colombo. Tell, us about, Franco. The yeah. Tell us about Franco. Tell us about Franco. Uh, Franco and I first met when I see I was the, an executive at the Los Angeles Times. I was actually a vice president. I was very wow. young, very getting impressive. promoted, and I was still in my twenties. And I wanted to lift weights. I mean, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be a bodybuilder, right. but at the same time, be this executive. So, well, I was so lucky that the publisher of the Los Angeles Times was named Otis Chandler. And Otis was a weightlifter when he was, he went to Stanford. And when he was at Stanford, his nickname was shoulders because he was so broad <laughs> in the shoulders. That's great. And he qualified uh, for the Olympics in shot putting. Oh, wow. And uh, then broke a wrist like a week before. So he couldn't compete, uh, but he loved weightlifting. And so he had a, an, a, a gym for the executives and it was in, what I thought a bunch of old men in their forties and fifties. <laughs> now now, now we know that that's not so old, right? <laughs> right. So, uh, but Otis, you know, when I went into that gym, I remember he was squatting with three fifteen, and he was 56 years old. Right. That's and awesome. I said, Oh my God, you're strong. Can I give you a spot? And he said, yes. In fact, you're the first person who's ever asked me that question in this gym. <laughs> so we bonded right away and started working out together a lot. Yeah. Well, 
I had um, decided rather than, you know, at, at, at this point, I think I was around 30 years old. And I thought rather than, uh, I don't have time to be a gym rat. I really want the most efficient way to build muscles. And so I saw, I was reading a muscle and fitness. I saw a full page ad for Franco Colombo. And his office was in Westwood. And I was living in a, my wife and I were in a small apartment in Santa Monica. So right. I called up and made an appointment to see him, not to, not for chiropractic, but for, mm -hmm. um, for bodybuilding. Right. And he told me, you know, we'll take off your shirt. And I said, do I have to? <laughs> and yes, you have to. So, and he studied me from the front, the side and the back. Then he said, okay, put your shirt on. And then he wrote out a program. And when he talked about eating, he said, just eat. if it comes, you know, wrapped in a, in a package or in a box, try to avoid it, eat raw, you know, I mean, healthy foods, organic foods and so on. Uh, basically a Mediterranean diet. And I started following Franco's program. And I remember going over to Gold's Gym. It just opened on Hampton. It had just moved. Okay. I remember meeting Dan Duchesne. He was telling me like at five in the morning. Do you know who that, you know who that is? Of course, the steroid yeah. guru, yeah. Right. So Dan was telling me I needed to get on steroids. And of course. I told him, no, I'm not. A, I, no, thank you. I'm, I've got this executive <laughs> job at the LA Times. And anyway, so I remember early one morning, like 530, uh, there were only a few of us in the gym. And there was this guy at the, at the fence in the back door. He goes, hey, buddy, open the fence, would you? So I did. And it was Lee Haney. He couldn't no have been way. nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he couldn't have been nicer. Um, I met Mike Menster. Yeah. I talked to him. He was very sort of scholarly. Yeah. Um, but in the book, I talk about how when you when you lift weights for a lifetime, you learn what you like and what you don't like. Yeah. And uh, especially now in my 70s, I say I throw out the idea of no pain, no gain. And I embrace the idea the best workout is the one you like enough to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. right. And so Mike Menser, you know, was coming out with heavy duty training, one or two sets, maximum uh, stressors, you know, just do a little bit of warm up. And then you do your your one one set with 500 pounds or whatever. And um, what I've learned later is that program does not appeal to me at all. What I like is starting with lighter weights, working up to a maximum set. Mm -hmm. But so the whole point is you got to figure out what you like. What I did admire about Menser was that at least he was um, he was challenging the status quo and always questioning everything. Yeah, he was a very bright guy. What now? You uh, said that you um, you you had interactions with Arnold. What would you say was like? Um... I don't know, the most insightful thing that maybe you learned from Arnold over the years. Or there were so many, but I, I would say it's that the, what I said earlier about you don't, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, that Arnold knew what he wanted and he basically was out of, Arnold out of my way, Schwarzenegger. You know, he got what he wanted. He wasn't mean to people. Uh, he was very nice. Um, yeah. I remember when we had lunch once at the LA Times and we were walking, this was like just after Conan had come out. Okay. Um, so it was at that point. So he was becoming famous. I mean, he was pretty well known. But to give you an example, we walked down one block together in downtown Los Angeles, and about four different people came up and asked for his autograph. Hmm. And I remember saying to him, Doesn't that drive you crazy having your privacy invaded like that? And he said, No, I don't know what you're talking about. How could you not want people to ask for your autograph? <laughs> so it was a different, we, you know, a different constitution, yeah. different right. temperament. So you said you uh, you knew Bertel Fox very well. Is that what, what was your I, take I knew, on him? I knew Bertel extremely well. Bertel, um, by the way, for those who don't know, is in jail for murder. You know, in St. Kitts, still murdering his girlfriend. I don't know. Did you know have any insight into that, or was this before all that went down? Uh, well, it was before, but I do have some insight into okay. it, and it's in the book where Bertel Fox. Um, what happened was I was at World Gym. This was, I think, nineteen eighty three. Mm -hmm. working out hard. I had, well, okay, well, I didn't get with Franco. I made so much progress with Franco. And part of the reason was I had done all that early bodybuilding mm -hmm. when I was 12, 13, 14. And my muscles just sprouted. So when I went back to Franco and he said, take off your shirt the second time, <laughs> uh, 
he he just he literally got bug eyed. He said, I cannot believe it. I cannot. This is unbelievable. I never <laughs> saw someone make so much progress. Right. And he was calling people in, you know, to look at me standing. It was kind of embarrassing. But that was that just motivated me so much. And then about a, a year later, I kept seeing Franco once a month. That was his idea of personal training. Right. You'd go in and get a program. And I was very disciplined uh, and juggling a lot between my career and family. And um, he told me he was writing a book for businessmen. And would I be willing to uh, pose for pictures, doing exercises and things? And I said, I not only would be willing, I'd be honored. This would be great. And at that time, Frank Zane had something called Zane Haven. In right. Palm Springs, right. Where he and Christine uh, would have you know, aspiring bodybuilders. And I signed up for five days at Zane Haven. And then my boss at the LA Times had gone mountain climbing as a lark and he wound up collapsing and they airlifted him to a hospital and thought it was a heart attack. Later it was diagnosed as altitude sickness. But anyway, they, I was told, well, you can't go to Palm Springs. You've got to be here running place in his absence. <laughs> and I said, well, I paid five hundred dollars for the for this thing. And they they reimbursed me the money. And that at that time, that was a huge yeah, amount of money. Sure. And they reimbursed it. And um, uh, so on Friday, I called Christine, talked to her. And she said, I said, well, I can make it this weekend. And she said, great. So on Friday night, I drove down to Palm Springs. And um, I learned so much in two days and had so much fun. Now, I know Franco and Frank competed a lot. Yeah. And it, the rumor was they didn't like each other. But the reality of Franco had a lot of respect for Frank Zane. And he said, oh, no, you'll learn a lot. You should go. Right. Um, what well, was it more psychological or was it was it working out and bodybuilding training, stuff like that, too? It, it was both. Okay. It was both. Um, and Franco, uh, Frank Zane was was much more specific on nutrition gotcha um you know on carb uh, monitoring carbs and mm -hmm. and uh not just calories not just a mediterranean diet so yeah. you know i learned a lot um and i and i used the photo sessions with bob gardner who became a friend yeah he shot for weeder for years yeah right he was in in retirement after Joe sold the magazine. Bob was his still. I think Gail Gardner and Betty Weeder are still very close. Friends. Oh, really? That's funny. I didn't know yeah. that. Yes, um, I remember all the contest pictures I had early in my in the early nineties and mid nineties was all Bob Gardner. Everything was Bob right. Gardner. Right. You know, no, he so. was a great photographer and a really good guy. Um, so after I. You know, because for three months I, I dieted and, and I looked at that almost like a contest, being ready for those photos at World Gym. Um, after that, I thought, well, I need a new goal, you know. And at that time, Bertel Fox w had come over from England. He was a three-time Mr. Universe. Mm -hmm. And he would come into World Gym with his wife, Kim, who worked right. out. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was from Jamaica. He was from uh, St. Kitts. Gotcha. But but he grew up in London um, and uh, he was, you know, bench pressing 500 pounds uh, for reps. And so I said to him, you know, I'm really trying to learn a lot about uh, technique and and, you know, you know what con controlled cheating is. Yeah. And Bertle Fox was a master at controlled cheating. And I said, I've got a brother who just moved out to L.A. and he's a really good photographer and would it, what would you think if we made a home movie of you working out, you know, right. doing all body parts over two days? And so he said, great, I would love that. Uh, I said, you could sell it. It's fine with me. I don't care. And my brother was, he said, yeah, it sounds like fun. So he came up, we went up to World Gym. My brother remembered one thing, which was that Joe Gold said, um, you can film as long as you you don't film Lou Ferrigno or you don't film somebody who's going to complain about it, <laughs> you know, say, talk to my agent. So we said, OK, well, then what happened was Arnold showed up right. and I said, hey, Arnold, would you be willing to sit next to Bertle and I can ask you questions? And my brother can film. He said, no, I'd love that. Oh, wow. I would love that. That that was fun. So yeah. we did that. I interviewed Arnold. We That's have awesome. that on video. Really? That's um, crazy. That's great. Yeah. No, Bertle wound up selling those uh, videos through Joe's through Muscle and Fitness. Right. 
And he, I remember at one point I was in his apartment in Woodland Hills and I was going to take him over to the DMV to, for his driver's license test. And he, um, he, I said, how did you make any money on those videos? And he said, yeah, a little bit. And so he, I looked at his, <laughs> at his, uh, financial figures. I said, man, you made 53 grand. So he far. did on that video. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. This is great. I'm really happy for you. I wasn't, you didn't want I, you money know, now. Yeah. No. So, um, that's when, so then Bertel said, after we made the videos, he came over to my apartment in Santa Monica. We have a balcony. So the last interviews uh, for that video were on the balcony because yeah. we wanted something outside. And he said, um, listen, would you be willing to be my training partner? I said, Bertel, I can't be your training partner. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm benching two and a quarter, you know, working up to that, <laughs> and you're warming up, you know, you're benching 500 pounds. We would spend the whole workout taking off plates. Yeah. He said, no, if we could find one person who's at your strength level, then you guys would have one bench and your bar and I would have the other. And, you know, with dumbbells, it's just go up and down the rack. Right. And with machines, you just move the pins. So there would be no problem. So that's what we did. I found a friend, Mike Myers. Uh, I didn't know him very well then but he i saw him working out very hard and um so the three of us trained together for a couple of well for one year full time and then for weekends for three years and we wow. became good friends we would have a lot of lunches and dinners together we would go to breakfast a lot after working out for a three-hour workout at world gym Jeez. um and with kim i got to know kim pretty well i really liked her yeah uh, in fact, I've been trying to send her a copy of the book, and I nobody seems to know where she is. Kim um, who? What's that? Kim who? I, I can't. Kim, you said Kim. Kim. Kim, Kim who? Fox. Kim Fox. Oh, Bertel's wife. Oh, Bertel Bertel Fox's wife. Kim. Oh, okay. So she. Um, so he left his wife and was was he with a girl? Another girl? Is that what the story was? Well, okay. So he and Kim were. That seemed like a very happy couple. Mm -hmm. One morning I'm at the LA Times, I think it was a Monday, and he called me and he was crying. And yeah. he said, Oh man, Kim left me. She moved in with her mother in San Francisco, and I can't handle this. She doesn't understand the pressure I'm under dieting for the Olympia. This was the 1984 Olympia. Yeah. We had helped him get ready for the 83 Olympia when he was really happy with Kim. And if you go on YouTube and do 1983 Olympia, and look at Bertel Fox. He was far and away the most massively muscled man in the world at that time. Um, so now in 84, he's trying to, to replicate that. And Kim moved out. So he gave me a number in San Francisco where she had moved in with her mother. Mm -hmm. I called, spoke with Kim, and I said, he really needs you. And she said, no, man, in a thick Jamaican accent. <laughs> I am not going back. He stabbed me with a fork. I got nine stitches oh, in my chin. Had to go to the hospital. And I said, whoa, that's serious. Uh, yeah. Okay, stay away. And I always was a little more wary of Bertle after that. Yeah, I can imagine. So <laughs> as I wrote in the book that what happened when he got down to St. Kitts, according to the charges that he was convicted of, yeah. I mean, what happened was the demons that drove him to stab Kim yeah. came with him. And yeah. he had a gun and he shot and killed his girlfriend at the time and her mother, who had stood in front of her uh, when he aimed a gun at them, according to the yeah. conviction. So it was very, very sad. What was, the, did, what was the whole reason that, that that happened? Was there, I mean, what was the misunderstanding about? Uh, according to a documentary, it's a really good documentary. It's on YouTube called Death and the Bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. um, according to that, I think he, uh, I think she, had dumped him and oh. taken up with a uh, a different boyfriend. I got you. I got you. It's a shame he had such an anger problem, man. That was uh, he was such a great bodybuilder, you know. It's true. Ruined his it's life. True. Yes, it did. <laughs> I apologize for that. So it happens when you run a business, busy man. Yeah. <laughs> so of all the bodybuilders that you encountered in Venice, you know, I I hear you have a lot of good Joe Gold stories. <laughs> what was your take yeah. on Joe Gold, who ran obviously? started a gold's gym but then he also started a world gym and he ran that for most of his life you know that's right and joe was you know i mean he everybody knew he was a curmudgeon um he, <laughs> he just he enjoyed being ornery he enjoyed 
uh, mocking people, right. um, but in a nice way. Yeah. Uh, he was a little bit homophobic. <laughs> uh, you know, he'd come into the gym in the morning and there'd be a dozen guys working out, maybe one woman like Patty Davis, Ronald Reagan's <laughs> daughter, who always would come in early and work out hard yeah. in, the, in the old world gym. And uh, Joe would walk in and say, good morning, ladies. <laughs> he, you know, he and I, I, I remember once I said, because my kids were little at the time, and I said, Joe, it was a, the, this was World Gym on Main Street. And right. Main Street was pretty heavily trafficked, yeah. cars whizzing back. I said, Joe, why don't you set up a child care for the gym, you know, so I could get <laughs> my kids. And he said, yeah, yeah, we'll set up a child care right down there in the middle of Main Street. <laughs> that was Joe. Yeah, he had a, he he used to call Lee Priest Fat Boy, but he loved but he loved Lee Priest. You know that was uh, one of his favorite body roles. You know, and I know Lee used to take him shopping when it, in his later years when he uh, he wasn't able to walk and stuff like that. Lee would take him to the right. supermarket and you know take him through the airports if he had to travel. So, you know, he was very loyal though, Joe, wasn't he, to the people that like you know were close to him? Yeah, he was. He was. Um, and what's re what was really surprising was that. I hardly ever saw Joe, I don't think, other than wearing a World Gym jacket, he just wore World Gym sweatshirts, sweatpants, flip-flops, and you had the feeling, I mean, he was a welder, and he was a great welder, yeah. as well as a bodybuilder, but you had the feeling that he was um, uh, impoverished or, you know, fighting for every penny. And when he died, I heard that he was worth tens of millions of dollars, you know, oh, really? between between the building, the, the original oh. world gym that he, he always bought his building. So he was smart in real estate. Yeah. That way. Um, I thought he gave that building to Arnold when he thought he, remember he was really sick at one point. And yeah, that was a different, that was okay. There were three world gyms that Joe had one, three locations. Yeah. One was on main street in Santa Monica. Yeah. Then he moved to Abbott Kinney Boulevard. Right. In Venice. That's the one I remember. Yeah. Then he bought a sizzler in Marina del Rey. And it was the oh, right, on the, right, right on Lincoln there, right? right Washington, Lincoln, Washington, Washington was on, right? Yeah that's, yeah, that's correct. And that's the one that I think sold. I think Mike Urich sold that for five point eight million dollars. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, wow. After Joe's death, yes. Wow. But Joe never shared in any of that money. Um, no. Who did, he have, did Joe Kinney, have any kids? No. Oh. No. Wow. The Abbott Kinney um, Jim. Well, yeah, he, the way, the story that I heard was that uh, he thought he was on his deathbed and he called Arnold to the hospital or maybe Arnold was just visiting him yeah. to cheer him up. But he said, look, I want to give you the gym. So he gave Arnold the gym, the, Abit, the world gym on Abbott Kinney. And Arnold, as a favor, took it. Because remember, Arnold at this point was getting $25 million right. for being in Commando or right. something, right. Or Predator, or those movies. And um, so um, Arnold, uh, Joe recovered his health. And meanwhile, Arnold, uh, so Joe said, Arnold, okay, give me back the gym. And Arnold said, great, but you have to pay these transfer taxes. Because, uh, you know, I mean, I just did this as a favor to you. I right. didn't get any profit out of it. And, sure. uh, and Joe said, I'm not paying any taxes. <laughs> oh, oh, that's what it was. I thought Arnold didn't want to give him back the building. I didn't know it was just some taxes he wanted him to pay. I heard it was a tax oh, issue, oh, okay. which makes more sense. Yeah, it makes way more sense. Yeah, way more sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, so and I think Arnold was right on that. Arnold's a really smart businessman. Yeah, yeah. And I can't see Ar Arnold's very loyal to his friends. I can't see Arnold saying, I'm not giving you the building back. You know, I, you yeah. know it just it doesn't right. seem right. You know, but you get it back. But if they give me a hundred thousand dollar tax bill, you got to pay it because it's your <laughs> building, not mine. That's right. That's I right. And you were close to Rick Drayson, too, our good friend. We have a, that's a mutual friend of ours, obviously. I loved Rick Drayson. Me, too. Um, I talked to him. I think a few hours before he died. Oh, wow. And it was so sad. He was in the hospital. We couldn't visit him because of COVID. Right. And he was crying, understandably, because he was really in pain. Mm -hmm. He said he had just talked to Corey Everson, <clears throat> and she was so uh, supportive and nurturing. And he, he just felt so flattered by that. And he said, yeah. when I get out of here, uh, she's the first person I'm going to call and uh, get together with. And because she, she, I think she had lost her husband, Jeff, recently, yes. you know, shortly before or that. Ex-husband and, Jeff. And so she was in mourning herself and very sympathetic. 
And Rick, um, he said, you know, well, I'm 76. This is when he started crying. He said, I'm 76, and that's a good age for a bodybuilder to die. Larry Scott was 76. Franco was 78. I said, Rick, cut it out. I'm yeah. writing this book. I need you. I got a whole chapter about how wonderful you are. <laughs> I need you to stay alive so right. I can uh, <laughs> we can promote each other together. Yeah. And uh, But it was just so sad. Um, what was the official cause of death for uh, Rick Drayson? I don't know. Um, I know he, his legs were bloated. Um, I think it was heart related probably, right? It could be, or it could have been kidneys, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Interesting. I don't yeah, know. he was a great guy. What a talented guy too. So creative and uh, artistic. And I mean, just that's right. Multi-talented. People don't realize that Rick can do it all. He was edit, he used to edit his own videos. And you know, who, what 70 plus year old edits its own videos? You know, he just liked, he was very creative like that. I know exactly. I had to talk going. about it with him. I said, Rick, who does all your video editing? He goes, I do it myself. I said, you yeah. do? How did you learn how to do it? He goes, I taught myself. Yeah. <laughs> he showed me how, how he does it yeah. out at his house in yeah. uh, Sherman Oaks. Um, yeah, you, you, they don't come any better than Rick Drayson. Yeah. Super uh, nice guy. You, you, loved I, I assume really. everybody knows he created the, the logo. The, the, the two logos. We, he was at, at Zucky's at Delicatessen, mm -hmm. and it was Ken Waller who had the idea of Mr. Clean. Right. Uh, and so Rick, being a doodler, you know, did the drawing and yeah. showed it to Ken, and Ken said, okay, now bend the barbell a little bit. On either <laughs> side. So he did that. But then when Joe started World Gym, he turned to Rick, and, um, and Rick created the gorilla with sure. the globe. Um, which of the two logos, that's the one I actually like better. I think there's something more clever about it. There was a guy at World Gym. He couldn't have been nicer. Um, his name was Big Steve. He had been a wrestler with J Jesse Ventura. Is that Steve Marjanian or something like that? Um, a different different oh, Steve. Okay. Steve Marjanian was a power lifter. Okay. Who, oh, was he a, a nice person? And I just love that guy. And was he strong? He he would do incline. That's something, you know, with after getting to know Franco, we and having a publishing company about five years ago, I had lunch with Franco and I said, hey, what happened to all your best selling books from the 70s? Yeah. Uh, maybe we could republish those as ebooks and on demand paperbacks. Yeah, yeah. And he said, great idea. You know, he he couldn't believe, you know, when I showed him his book on a Kindle on an iPhone. <laughs> That's great. He, laughed. he said, "That's my book on this phone. This is amazing." So we we took winning bodybuilding and made an audio book of it. And one and one of the things uh, which is available now on Audible.com, mm -hmm. and w the problem with it was when Franco started reading the book, you couldn't understand him, and I had to stop him <laughs> and say, "Franco, wait, let's just talk about what's in there." So we went through line by line, chapter by chapter. So if you listen to the audiobook and hold up the the paperback or the Kindle book, you'll see that um, that we we did that and we tried to call it conversations about winning bodybuilding, but Audible has an algorithm where they said, no, you got to use the original book title. Um, so anyway, um, but when but Franco tells in the audiobook how he came to America. And he was always the, the strongest guy in the gym. So he would go over and do incline bench presses with 315 just yeah. to warm up. And he said, this guy, Steve Merjanian, comes over and Franco says, okay, do you want me to take off one or two plates? And Steve said, no, no, just leave it the way it is. So then he said, F Steve does about 20 reps. And he says, oh, <laughs> this guy's stronger than I am. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Good, great stories, Rick. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, and talking to us. How, where can people pick up your book if they want to? On read Amazon it? is probably the easiest place, yeah. or go to Creators Publishing. Okay. Can the I hold magic it up of lifting time? weights? Great. Yeah, I've gotten some really good feedback. Do you know who Charles Gaines is? Yeah, of course. He wrote the Pumping Iron, the Pumping Iron yeah. and he narrated the documentary. Mm -hmm. He sent me a note. Uh, I just loved it. He said, man, I love your book. It's such a great story. Lee Haney sent me a note. Uh, I wrote down what he said. He said, you know, Lee has a great quote, uh, which is to stimulate, use weights to stimulate. Not annihilate. Not annihilate. Yeah. That's a great quote. But That's Lee wrote, favorite. keep inspiring us to take care of our greatest asset. And that's the message I want to communicate to you and to your audience that 
all this knowledge we have about building muscles can be used to staying young in our 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. I agree. I agree 100%. I learned, look, John Romano and I are very fond of saying that, that there are no 350 pound 60 year olds out there. All right. Right. They, they all right. die off. So if you want to live a long, you know, healthy life, at some point you have to downsize a little bit as you get older so that you're not putting a tremendous strain on your body that, you know, when you're young, your body can handle it. When you get older, it's, it's not quite as resilient. And so, uh, you know, I, you I'm could, trying to educate people as, as, as to that fact, if, you know, for, for good health. But if you give yourself permission to use lighter weights, right. you, you can't believe how good you feel. Oh, you, I, I, I 100% know what you're talking about. 100%. Yeah. Just the idea of going to the gym and just squeezing and feeling that contraction and eating healthy, you just, you just feel good. You have more energy during the day. I don't even need to, you know, I don't need, I don't need stimulants or anything like that. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to go when I wake up in the morning, you know? Yeah, no, and you look great. You Thank sound you. great. You have a clarity in your eyes and your face, and those things are really important. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think a lot of people have to reevaluate their bodybuilding, I guess, goals as they get older and understand that you, it's okay to change how you look and what you do, but still stick to the same functional bodybuilding lifestyle because that's what that's what got you success. But you don't have to push the envelope like you did when you were 20, 30, and 40s. You know, you have you have to kind of change the the uh, the I guess the, the main thrust of what you're trying to do because now the goal is to live a long time and feel good while you're doing it. I don't want to live to 100 if I'm sick and 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 in bed the whole time. You know, I'd rather be dead. You know. But if I can feel good up until the day I die, you know, then, 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 I, then I think we accomplished what we were supposed to, you know? Yes. And there, there are techniques to motivate yourself to keep training that I talk about in the book. So, for instance, I was um, uh, doing squats with 100 pounds, which is not so much it's from the old days. It's yeah. not much. Uh, on the other hand, I bought these... Uh, you know, the, the big plates, the bumper plates or yeah. whatever they're called, the yeah. rubber, the 10 pounds that look like 45. Yeah, it motivates so you. <laughs> the bar looks like I'm squatting with 300. <laughs> Here I am, my 70, going yeah. all the way down and thinking, man, am I strong. <laughs> I conscious. So little tricks like that. I talk in the book about yeah. how I've managed to stay motivated to keep training. Go. There you go. Hey, you, you still got great arms, and that, that's enough motivation right there alone. If you could hit, if you could throw up an arm shot at, at 68 years old and look like uh, you know, you're 20, you're, you're doing something right. Rick, thank you so much for joining us and giving us all your great stories, and uh, t give my regards to Ed Connors if you talk to him. Thanks very much, Dave. Will all right. do. Guys, that's going to take us to the end of another episode of RX Muscles History of Bodybuilding. I'm Dave Palumbo with Rick Newcomb. We'll see you next time.